Hi people, it's Archivist here. As it's been such a long time since I've done a list form video, I wanted to do something a bit controversial. And well, what's more controversial than looking at the greatest controversies within gaming? Unfortunately, I couldn't find a way to quantify the most polarizing moments throughout the whole of gaming history. So instead, I decided to simplify it for myself and just went back a decade and looked at some of the most polarizing things that have happened and that really stood out to me. But of course, if you can think of some other moments that really stood out to you as being particularly controversial, please feel free to share them. But these are eight that stood out to me. Let's start the list with the oldest entry on here, and that is the Mass Effect 3 ending, or to be more accurate, endings. So to contextualise why this caused so many people to get annoyed, you have to look at the Mass Effect series as a whole. Mass Effect 1, and arguably even more so Mass Effect 2, were massive critical successes, and although they did a lot right, I think it was really the world building and the character development that made people fall in love with the series. And as effective as this was, it did create this true rod for Bioware's back in that they needed to end the series in an explosive way, do something that really meant something, but also summed up and tied in all the decisions you have made throughout the series so it felt like your personal journey you had made throughout the Mass Effect universe had come to a fitting conclusion. However, the endings were very underwhelming, they were very short, they were very basic, and didn't really make you feel as if the decisions you had made were that meaningful at all. In fact, you were just given at the end a decision, a binary decision to make, and what you had done before didn't really matter. So obviously, while players had had fun playing those previous games, a lot of people felt, well, it feels like all that investment I made was a bit of a waste of time because ultimately it's just coming down to this one moment. And that one moment then led to uh, an outcome that wasn't particularly impressive. It was a bit of a cop-out. Now, the outrage itself was, for me personally, and I have to very uh, carefully say that, this was just m when I was starting to use... Uh, YouTube and social media more. Uh, this was the biggest backlash I had ever seen. And as someone who did play the game as well, I can't say I had a massively strong reaction to it. I just felt like, okay, that wasn't as good as Mass Effect 2, uh, but I enjoyed it more or less. I felt it was a bit watered down, but there you go, that's Mass Effect 3. But then I started to realise that some people felt incredibly upset with this ending, and I have to say... um. It was initially quite difficult for me to empathise because I hadn't had that same connection. I, for example, didn't play Mass Effect 1 all the way through. I did play Mass Effect 2 all the way through, but I, I must have just not had that strong connection to the series that some people had, which led them to be uh, so frustrated. But the outcome of all that rage and all that anger was quite good because at least it led to some alternative endings, what some people would call true endings, uh, being released as future DLC. So at least something was offered uh, afterwards. But the reality is the damage is done and it has gone down in history as that game with the really bad ending to a trilogy. It will never be forgotten for that. This is my favourite entry on the list, Fortnite Crossplay. Crossplay back in the previous generations of consoles was a bit of a myth. I remember playing Call of Duty 4 with my friends at school, but it was always a shame that we were split. We had some of us who were on the Xbox 360 version of the game, and others were on the PlayStation 3 version of the game, and we often just thought, why can't we just play together? We have a game that is, for all intents and purposes, exactly the same thing. The differences between them were very minimal. Why can't we just play together? Why are we separated because we happen to own slightly different consoles, right? But then, with Fortnite, crossplay became a reality. And particularly between Microsoft and Nintendo, they really uh, drove this as a selling point, where if you were on either console, you could play with one another. And I thought that even as someone who doesn't play a lot of Fortnite, I thought this was a fantastic precedent to set. But Sony, they held out. And it's not hard to see why, because if you are the platform that is leading sales by quite a significant margin, you don't have anything to gain financially from crossplay. 
they are banking on situations like this from occurring where let's imagine you are playing Fortnite and you're on a PlayStation 4, all your friends are playing Fortnite, but you have one friend who hasn't yet gotten into the game. And you say, hi, Billy, I want you to play Fortnite with me. And you say, all right, um, sure, I'll, I'll go get Fortnite. How much is it? It's free. Oh, is it free? Oh, great. Uh, I'll get it. I'll just go download it on my phone. And, but I'll go, no, wait, Billy, you can't get it on your phone. You've got to get a PlayStation 4 if you want to play with us. And then Billy has to go out and spend all that money on a PlayStation 4. And it's something that perpetuates. Where the bigger the player base is, the more likely you are to suck more people into that uh, isolated ecosystem. So it's very much in Sony's favour for that kind of situation to occur. Because then they can just bring more and more people in. So whereas someone might genuinely want to get an Xbox and play Xbox, they may not do it in the end because none of their friends play Xbox. So they would just be on their own on it. So that's how you can get this perpetuating effect. But eventually Sony did decide, I think just because of how bad the PR got and how big the controversy got, they decided to just do it. And last year, I think they introduced it as a beta and now it is fully integrated. So crossplay is a thing now in Fortnite. And even if you're not a massive fan of Fortnite, uh, the impact this will have on the industry cannot be denied. I mean, just look at something like Call of Duty Modern Warfare coming out this year. That's going to be cross-play with PC and both Xbox and PlayStation. That is such fantastic progress and so consumer-friendly. If that was around when I was younger, I would have just been utterly, utterly grateful for that. And I just, I don't want it to be something people take for granted. Just be so happy that they are doing this now. It's such a great way for the gaming industry to go. And the thing is, if this starts becoming more common, then it means that other companies that otherwise wouldn't have done it will decide, look, we've got to do this because otherwise we're not competitive. Because, for example, Battlefield now. Can Battlefield truly uh, continue to segregate between versions if uh, Call of Duty are now using that as a key selling point? They may be forced to. So now it's going to be something more and more common. So although Sony holding out on cross-play for so long with Fortnite was undeniably controversial, the eventual reality of what happened was extremely positive. Don't you guys have phones is now an immortalised phrase, rather fittingly by Diablo Immortal. So this was BlizzCon 2018 last year, where people were very excited at the prospect of Diablo 4 potentially being announced and were very excited. Some people made the trip to BlizzCon itself, waiting with bated breath, what will the new Diablo be like? But then there was this huge backlash when it was announced to be a mobile game called Diablo Immortal. And this is the thing, right? When people look at a mobile game, people aren't inherently annoyed at the idea that they have to play a game on phones because people loved, for example, the Switch version of Diablo 3 because they liked the idea, oh, look, I can take Diablo on the go. So it's not necessarily the idea that it's going to be in a mobile form factor that really gets people on this. It's what people know mobile gaming is. It's just this massive casino economy now where everything's free and uh, to, to get into, I should say, but then to get anywhere within the game, you have to just spend lots of money. And it's a really frustrating, exploitative environment now and uh, I, I mean, for me, the biggest tragedy of mobile gaming is that it could have been so much more. There's no reason that we should have to hear the word mobile gaming and have such a negative reaction, but they did it to themselves by going down this horrible um, practice of getting you in with the free download and then saying, if you want to play just a bit longer, you just got to pay us a bit more. Okay, just a bit more now, just a bit more now. Do you want to have a fighting chance in this next level? Well, you've got to pay us to upgrade your item and things like crafting. And it's all seeping into mainline gaming as well now. It's all just one horrible uh, casinified mess that I really don't like. Uh, but yeah, uh, to get back to the uh, Diablo Mortal topic especially, what I will say though, obviously I've made my feelings clear there on mobile gaming, but at the same time, I think the reaction was a little bit stronger than it needed to be because the reality is it's not being developed by the Diablo team. It's being offshored. And it's not going to take away from Diablo 4, which is coming. I suppose that wasn't as clear at the time, though. So maybe my hindsight is making me a little bit more amenable to the um, original announcement. And OK, yes, the guy did say something really stupid, like, don't you guys have phones? But he was clearly panicking. That wasn't a premeditated response. He 
I mean, he was getting booed on stage. The guy should be given a medal for being as composed as he was, right? And there was, uh, I felt, I felt a little bit like people got overly aggressive at that guy um, who was on stage because he was just delivering the message and had to react to something. I'm sure he didn't want to deliver that message. Uh, so it was a bit of an awkward situation. I don't think Blizzard, uh, I'm sure a lot of the developers there, uh, people who actually make the mainline games, wanted that to be there. So it was just a little bit of an unfortunate addition to the end of the show. But I will tell you this, I would not be surprised now if Blizzard are far more careful with their audiences because getting booed when you make an announcement like that is not a good look. Uh, for people who point to Bethesda, for example, who very obviously get people in from agencies to cheer whenever they make even the most minor of announcements to do with their game, uh, you it's almost understandable when you see how bad it looks if they actually go against you if you get booed. So I wouldn't be surprised now if um, at BlizzCon we see far less authentic audiences. Maybe not entirely a, a paid agency audience, but maybe just a mix now. Uh, because it was just such a, such a bad reaction to that. To think that people were so excited for the next Pokemon entries when they were first announced, only to hear now that not all of the Pokemon will be supported in the national deck, so perhaps your favourite Pokemon that you've had with you since the dawn of Pokemon may not be playable in this game, it may not even have a supported model. This is an interesting one because there truly are two camps, it is polarising in the greatest sense of the word. Um, on the one side, you have people saying that this is a travesty and that they have more than enough money to invest in getting model creators in to get all of these Pokemon into the game. That's one argument. And then on the other side, there is the idea that at some point they had to stop including all previous Pokemon because it wouldn't have been sustainable to have, let's say, 3,000 Pokemon in the game all there all up to the same standard, all supported, that wouldn't have been uh, correct. So this is just the point in time where they have decided to stop supporting all of them. For me personally, I haven't played a Pokemon game since, oh, when was it? Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. So my interest in Pokemon has been kept alive mostly through things like Smash Brothers. Oh, and when I did, I did admittedly, like everyone else in the world, play Pokemon Go at one point. But I haven't played an actual mainline Pokemon game since Diamond and Pearl. So for me, I don't really have a horse in this race. But you can't deny that this has really taken off. And the number of videos dedicated to the topic of really digging into the nature of this and how long, for example, does it take to model a Pokemon and also animate it. It's, it's kind of interesting how much energy. If the amount of energy that has gone into deconstructing these Pokemon games, went into helping them for free and getting these Pokemon into the game, you could genuinely probably do it because that's the level of man hours we're talking here. It's crazy. But this will be an interesting one to see where it goes. I am probably not giving you the most exciting personal stance on this. I, I'm sort of indifferent. I haven't played the games in long enough for me to care that they won't include all of them. But it's certainly be interesting to see where it turns out. When DICE and EA decided to change history with Battlefield 5. So the crux of this controversy is this trailer. This is where it all began. This is the spark that ignited the fire, so to speak, where we saw that uh, women would be playable in online, in Battlefield 5, in a World War II shooter. And the issue with that being that that's not historically accurate, in that women played an absolutely undeniably integral role in World War II, but more so behind the scenes, uh, doing things like um, building munitions in factories, uh, performing essential medical care behind the scenes, behind the front lines, but not really fighting on the front lines, because it was a different time. Standards were different back then, and it's not necessarily something we have to agree with uh, in the modern times, but it is something that happened. That is the reality of what the situation was and so this defied the idea that this was supposed to be an authentic World War II shooter. But I'll tell you what 
really got me about this. And to get to the origin of this controversy, you actually have to go back to Battlefield 1. Because in Battlefield 1, you couldn't play as a female character. For the, for the very reasons I just described in Battlefield 5, because it wouldn't have made sense to have had a female character on the front lines in World War One. That just wouldn't have made sense. So naturally, Dyson-EA didn't include that as an option, because and, and in fact, they justified that as well, and they said it, and they were largely agreed with. But there was this small group of people at the time who were having a go at Dyson-EA for saying that they were being... Um, prejudice for not including female avatars and they gave the example of infinite warfare of all things which is a futuristic shooter and therefore a very inappropriate comparison but said that because they were doing it that dice in the a should have done it as well and said that they were not being progressive enough and i remember at the time thinking that these people were being absolutely ridiculous they clearly didn't play the game at all they didn't know what it was about and they would just be ignored and in fact dice in the a did at that time go back against them and say the reason we don't include female characters online is because women weren't on the front lines in World War One. Very simple explanation, made complete sense. Not trying to be um, exclusive to anyone, not trying to hurt anyone's feelings, just representing the time period. But then they just bent like a palm tree in the wind for the next one and they paid for it dearly because in listening to that very small group of people, they pissed off the people who actually played their games, the people who it makes sense to actually cater to. And it felt like a real own goal, like a real shot in their own foot, because it's not as if they got this massive wave of support for doing it either. They, The people who they had bent the knee to didn't come to their aid and fight on their side. They just ignored it. Like, we don't care because we think this is normal. It's over now. But the people who were actually interested in playing their game uh, were very frustrated and indeed sales figures for Battlefield 5 were down as a result which I have to say is a real shame because in terms of just the sheer gameplay and the technical prowess of Battlefield 5 it's a very decent game. I did admittedly prefer Battlefield 1 quite a bit more but Battlefield 5 it's okay it's fine I still would rather play Battlefield 5 than Black Ops 4 for example but because of that initial controversy it's just something it hasn't been able to live down. Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, that reveal trailer got downvoted to hell pretty much. So the small controversy I think was around the fact that it was just another futuristic Call of Duty and people were tired of that by this point. They wanted to either go back to the modern setting or go back to World War II and they wanted advanced movement to be left by the wayside. I personally just thought that Advanced Movement was a watered-down version of what Titanfall offered, so yeah, I didn't really care for it either. But what was the true catalyst for this controversy was the fact that in order to play Modern Warfare Remastered, something that people really did want to play, you had to also buy Infinite Warfare, so they were packaged together. And this made people so, so angry, because they really wanted to play Modern Warfare Remastered, because COD 4 is regarded by many as the strongest entry in the series, or at least where it got really good. But the fact you had to also get something you didn't really want to buy felt like you were being strong-armed into supporting something you really didn't want to support. So it wasn't just that it cost more, but also you weren't able to show that you didn't want to play Infinite Warfare because you had to buy it in order to be able to play uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare Remastered. And this is what caused, at the time, so much uh, backlash and frustration. And I think this might be the lowest that Call of Duty has ever been. I remember that Call of Duty Ghost is where people started to turn against Call of Duty in slightly larger numbers, but this is where there was true hatred being thrown at the franchise, which I have to admit is a little bit of a shame because the campaign in Infinite Warfare was actually really good, like one of the best in the entire series. The multiplayer, okay, yeah, I didn't really care about the multiplayer, but yeah, the campaign, it was solid. And I remember playing it out of curiosity because I also bought Infinite Warfare to get Modern Warfare Remastered. And I thought, okay, well, I've bought this game now. I might as well play the campaign. I thought, oh, well, that was good. Like, that was really good. 
It's like, oh, it's such a shame that so many people hate this game because they're not going to play the campaign now. I mean, I really have to be careful. It, it, it was a good campaign. And if you did something similar to me, where you got Modern Warfare Remastered back in the day, you played it and you never did Infinite Warfare because you just didn't want to, I would really encourage you to play the campaign. So it's a bit of a shame that they coupled them together because maybe then, if they hadn't have forced people to get it, they might have purchased it naturally just because they were curious and then the campaign um, would have been recognised as being pretty decent and it would have had a much better reputation but it's because of that uh, very divisive way of selling the game that they really just did a bit of an own goal on that one. When Disney have to call you and ask you to stop, you know you've done something very wrong. And that's what happened with Star Wars Battlefront 2. So with Battlefront 2, before the game came out, and that's very key to say, before the game came out, it was advertised that you would be able to spend real money to be able to purchase loot boxes. And in these loot boxes, you would have these star cards. And these cards would give you the ability to enhance your character online, meaning that you were more likely to win engagements and therefore the game was undeniably pay to win, indefensibly so. And if the game had come out like that, I simply would not have bought Star Wars Battlefront 2 because it wouldn't have been a fun game to play because you would never know if someone was able to beat you because they are skillful and they were able to actually earn those cards or because they just decided to spend money on the game. The moment you bring pay to win into a game, there is no longer any element of competition, right? Uh, but the controversy got so big, so massive. There were so many videos, so many Reddit posts. It got to mainline, mainstream uh, recognition to the point where there are now laws being created in some countries to outlaw loot boxes it's got that big that it's had a real world effect outside of the game that they had to actually pull it they just couldn't do it so when the game came out when it was officially launched to the public the ability to spend real money was 100 percent disabled you couldn't actually do it and then there was this period of not knowing what they were going to do. Were they going to just turn them back on again once the storm had died down? Were they going to leave them out forever because they couldn't risk reintroducing them and just meant they wouldn't support the game anymore? Or were they going to bring them back with but with uh, cosmetic only? And I'm glad they took the route they did in the end because they decided to uh, bring back microtransactions but now it's purely for cosmetic items. And although... I appreciate there are plenty of people who still take issues with that. Um, the benefit of them doing that is that it has led to lots, and I mean a ton of free content being added to the game. So as a result of those cosmetic microtransactions being in the game, but leaving out the pay to win rubbish, I will honestly just put my flag down here and say this. I know this won't be the most popular opinion in the world, but Star Wars Battlefront 2 is, as of this point in time, a good game. In fact, I'll go further and say it is technically, ironically enough, fantastic value for money now because for what you spend, you get so much because of all the free content they added. But it could so easily have not been that way. It could have been a horrible, uncompetitive mess which was just ruled by people who paid to get advantages. But because of that controversy being so strong, it has led to the game being so much better. And so this is where I learned the lesson that sometimes, even if it sounds like the controversy is getting out of control, that it's becoming unreasonable even, if it does get to a certain degree, it does sometimes force change for the better. And I remember at the time definitely agreeing with people that pay to win was wrong, but I also thought that people were going a little bit, a little bit too far with it, just a tiny bit. But the reality is that because those people went a bit too far with it, that's what led to the change. If people had been a bit more moderate in their response, we wouldn't have got this. So I, I learned a pretty strong lesson that day in that if you want to express an opinion on this kind of thing, maybe get your opinion and you've kind of got to exaggerate it a little bit because otherwise you, if you are a more moderate person in terms of your outcry, although that is technically a more reasonable stance, you are less likely to create change. That's just a reality of it. Because if you're a reasonable person, people will try and take advantage of that, unfortunately. And that's a lesson I learned with this. So this is my number one controversy on this list, and that is the Xbox One 
reveal. They messed that up so badly. Oh my god. They just completely gave it to Sony that day. Oh. So this was back in 2013 now. Wow, that seems like such a long time ago. Where the next generation consoles were about to be announced and people waited with bated breath and I think generally speaking what people were doing were if you were a 360 gamer you were more excited for the next Xbox if you were a Sony gamer you were more excited for the next PlayStation right because you just wanted to progress within what you were already familiar with and what you were already invested with and I at the time was primarily a 360 gamer I, I played Xbox 360 more than I played on my PlayStation 3 and so I went in expecting to be a member of the next-gen Xbox. But then, when they did the reveal, they just started doing some very strange things. Uh, for me, personally, uh, the biggest problem was that they just didn't seem to focus on games much. They were focusing more on what the Kinect could do, that you could talk to your TV to control it, and that you would uh, have a much greater focus on um, using it as like a set-top box, basically. The very name Xbox One was supposed to mean that it was an all-in-one device. Your ultimate media center was what they were going for. But I know that two other things that really annoyed people were the fact that they forced you to use the Kinect with the Xbox One, even though, as we now know, there was no reason they had to do it. They were just trying to get more money out of people, which cost them dearly because it meant that PlayStation were able to very easily undercut them. And then the... What I think was the biggest point of contention, at first at least, was their DRM policy that they talked about, where you had to have your Xbox connected to the internet almost constantly, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to play your games, and that you wouldn't be able to trade your games with other people, because your disc would be locked to your device. So it meant that even though they were going to implement some home sharing uh, facilities where within your home, for example, you could share a game, you wouldn't be able to take your disc back to, say, um, you know, a game or something and trade it back because that disc would no longer be usable because it was now tied to your console. And from a business point of view, you can understand why they wanted to do it because that meant that they had far greater control over who was purchasing what games. But the reception to this was like nothing I'd ever seen at the time, and I still think it probably was stronger than the Battlefront 2 controversy. It was just absolutely immense, the backlash. And I think what's even more of an impact is that it pretty much, at that point, guaranteed that Sony were going to win this console generation, unless Microsoft did something absolutely amazing to turn the tide of battle and they didn't unfortunately they did make some good efforts to improve things but they've just never caught up with sony and it all starts with that original reveal of those um, anti-consumer policies and also when the console actually came out into the wild people very quickly realized that the xbox was less powerful than the playstation 4 whereas up until release there was some ambiguity about which one was more powerful so people just looked at the xbox as why would i spend more money on a less powerful console and then over time it became more of an issue of that the xbox one didn't have enough exclusives to warrant getting one why would i get an xbox one when it's barely got any games for it and that has only got worse over time unfortunately it looks like microsoft are certainly taking steps to try and rectify that now but for this generation they've just pretty much given up but i will i will give them some props uh they have made some very commendable choices in the latter half of this generation i think their backwards compatibility focus has been great because i think it's also going to force sony to start following on that it's always great when you can use your massive old library on a new console i think game pass is a really good uh, value proposition as well it would be nicer if the actual games available for game pass were more varied but you can't deny it's very good value for money and also the Xbox One X, just as a console. I've got one myself. I think it's a really well-engineered device. It's the most powerful console out there. It's relatively small, especially compared to the PlayStation 4 Pro. It makes less noise than the PlayStation 4 Pro. It means that when a game is not available on PC, like, for example, Red Dead Redemption 2, it becomes the definitive way to experience that game. But 
again, Sony have just run away with this generation because Microsoft just shot themselves in the head. They committed suicide at the very start of the line. They just never really regained momentum. But the thing is, that does give me some hope for the Scarlet with the next generation because you can be certain that they are going to learn from those mistakes they made before and they are going to go for the gamer because that's what that is really how Sony have won this generation. They did it from the start. Uh, they've made it part of their slogan is that they are making a console for the gamer as the number one priority. That is how they've done so well. And even the Nintendo Switch, if you look at that, uh, they've been far more conducive to the hardcore gamers now, including great third-party games like Doom and Wolfenstein, um, as well as their traditional uh, strong Nintendo first-party titles. And I think Xbox, that they've tried to come back to that, but it's just too late in the game for them to reverse all the things they did. So these were my top eight gaming controversies that I have witnessed as my time being a gamer on the internet. This is one of those lists where everyone is going to have different choices and different orderings of those choices. So please feel free to share yours in the comments below. As always, people, thanks very much for watching and see you next time.